go right after. So let's welcome my colleague. Hello. Um, I'll, just full disclosure, cards on the table. This is my first conference talk. I'm super nervous. Please go easy on me. Uh, good way to start. Can you hear me in the back okay? Great, thumbs up, fantastic. I want to talk about something very near and dear to my heart, uh, the portability of point and click adventure games. Uh, my name is Mike Conley, uh, as was just said, I'm a software engineer, I work at uh, Mozilla on the Firefox web browser. That's not what I'm here to talk about today, I'm here to talk about what got me going, what got me started, what I'm passionate about in computing, and what really sort of got my engine running uh, with working with computers um, in my life. And that, that would be this. This is a very important image for me when I was, uh, I mean, I'm really dating myself uh, by putting this up here. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with what you're looking at right now, but when I was younger, my, um, I was fortunate enough, my parents brought home a computer, and my uncle gave us some discs, and you know, those big five and a half inch floppy disks, and I put one in, and this came out the other side, and this was like the greatest thing. This game was my favorite. It's called King's Quest, it's from Sierra. You could walk around as this character, and it wasn't like one of those games where you're shooting people, or you know, uh, trying to take over uh, a planet or a country. I was just walking around solving puzzles and talking to people, and I loved that. Um, you know, you could die, and that was problematic, but you could walk around and, like, pick up a rock, or if you didn't type it incorrectly, you know, pick up a stone instead. Uh, you, you type in the bottom, and you do things, and you'd interact with the world, and I loved that. And, and this fascinated me. It absorbed hours and hours of my life. And they didn't, they don't all look like this. They're, this is a whole genre of games, and over time, I think this was made in the late 80s, maybe the early to mid 80s, uh, Going into the 90s, they started to look a little bit better. This is one of my favorites. This is a game called Simon the Sorcerer from VentureSoft. This was in the early to mid 90s. The art got a lot better, the sound got a lot better, and the puzzles also got a lot better. Um, and I, I love these. I played so many. This is just a small uh, subset of my favorites uh, of point and click adventure games. I play them to this day, from that point to this day. My partner and I are playing through the Nancy Drew series right now from her interactive. They're fantastic. I give them a big thumbs up, uh, and these are, are, are great. So why, why was that interesting to me? Um, or why am I talking about that today? I think I can trace back my career in software development to those games. Like I'm pretty sure those games are responsible for what I'm doing for a living today. When I was younger, I thought this is how it worked. You type in the executable name in DOS, you press enter, <laughs> and then pure joy came out the other side. Uh, and, and I wanted to know how it worked. I remember um, just this vague memory of being younger and using the DOS edit command to open up one of those executables to see what was inside, to see how it worked inside. And it was all just ASCII characters, very similar to what Ashley was showing us earlier, just like um, ASCII smiley faces and then maybe some strings from the dialogue. And I wanted to know how it worked and I wanted to make my own. And I remember making several feeble attempts at trying to make my own adventure game. None of which were ultimately any like successful at all, but like I found that through that I was able to learn a lot, and that's what that's the kernel of what I do today. That's where I started was trying to build these little uh, adventure games, and now I can look back through like a software engineering uh, lens. I can use the skills, abilities, and thinking that I've gained over time to look back at this, these formative years and sort of refine this structure. So. Yes, pure joy does come out the other side, but I now realize it's more like this. And this is actually, I'm, I'm so happy that Ashley talked before me, because this is probably uh, familiar. This is, uh, this, this shape um, is familiar, and I wish I could, I'd seen your slides earlier, because I would have built on them. But this is really kind of how it works. You run the executable, and then there are two primary components. There's the game assets, the logic, the story, the dialogue, the artwork, and the sound, and then there's an engine or an interpreter that's running the game logic and it's playing the sound and it's playing the music. And one plugs into the other. And, uh, and underneath that, there, I mean, the game engine interpreter will then be talking to the operating system. It actually <laughs> plugs in nicely to, to Ashley's graph from earlier. And that was fascinating to me when I found out that that's how it's structured. Because there are certain unique advantages to structuring your game this way. Um, and in fact, lots of games are designed like this. This is not unique to adventure games. Uh, there are other games like, 
I know that uh, a, a famous example early on was Doom. Doom was released uh, uh, back in the 90s. That was like a, one of those shooter games. But the engine was released separately from the source, or like the, the game asset, what they call the WAD files. You could like re-implement the engine and play the WAD files using like your own Doom engine if you wanted. So lots of games that are like this. And in fact, lots of software is like this. Firefox is kind of structured this way. There is a platform layer, and then there is the stuff on top of that platform layer that is Firefox. And that's, that to me, whenever I, I realized that this is kind of how things were structured, uh, that, it's that abstraction stuff that Ashley was talking about, that really uh, got me going. And one of the nice characteristics of having your game engine separated from your game logic and assets uh, is that you can rewrite the engine, you can swap out the engine. So a lot of those old games, like I showed you those screenshots, those games are from the late 80s, they were from the early 90s, they were designed to run on old operating systems like DOS and uh, very early versions of Windows, but usually DOS. They're not designed to run on OS X. They were not designed to run on your Linux box or on your Dreamcast or on your iPhone. Um, but because the engine is distinct from the game logic and game assets, the engine can be ported to those platforms without having to change any part of the game or the story of the game, which I found was really, really cool. Also for developing a game, it's, it's advantageous to have those two different components because you can kind of develop the game in parallel, I would imagine. I've never, I've never built one of these things before, but I would imagine it's nice to kind of have them in parallel because you can have a team of people working on the story and the art and the structure, and you have the other people who are working to support that. It's a bit like having the actors and the, the people who are, are, are on stage and telling the story, and then you have the people who are doing the lighting and the sound and designing the costumes. It's these two separate components that can work in parallel to ultimately tell you the story. Um, and so, yes, you can port or rewrite the engine. In, in fact, there is a project called ScumVM that I'm very excited about. So a lot of these old games, if, if the engines hadn't been rewritten or, or ported, I wouldn't be able to play them on modern hardware. I'd have to either virtualize old hardware, or I'd have to like dust off the old machine from my parents' house to play these games. But thankfully, some volunteers, some uh, contributors out there on the internet have built this wonderful open source piece of software called ScumVM, which re-implements all of the old interpreters and engines for a bunch of adventure games <coughs> that were able to play these games in 2017 on your Windows 10 box that like can do amazing things in the future. Um, so ScumVM is interesting to me because it supports over 200 games. It's all volunteers. I don't, I don't know if they accept money or I think it's all volunteer contributors. And they reverse engineer these old games from the 90s to figure out how they work inside and then re-implement the environment. They re-implement the engine. And then you plug in those old game asset files, the old scripts, the old sound, the old video, etc. You just plug it in and it, and it works. That abstraction that Ashley was talking about fully works. Um, and that's really, really uh, exciting for me. What's also really exciting is that whenever it was found that ScumVM was being built, adventure game developers from the 90s and the 80s found out about it and they donated source code. They didn't, they didn't plug the source code into ScumVM, but they said, hey, ScumVM developers, here's the source code for Simon the Sorcerer. Now, you can't put this in ScumVM, <coughs> but you can use it as a template for how you can re-implement the scripting engine. And that was really great. That, that helped them out a lot. And a lot of game, engine, uh, game engines for point-and-click adventure games have been ported this way uh, by people kind of sneakily submitting code to ScumVM contributors and saying, this is how we did it. This is how you can, like, re-implement the engine, which is exciting for me. So there's a lot of reverse engineering and reconstruction that goes on, and that's a pretty neat project. If you're interested in reverse engineering, if you're interested in reconstruction of old adventure game engines, um, or if you're just curious to know how these point-and-click adventure games work, uh, ScumVM is open source. You can check it out on GitHub. You can see how all the different engines work, and uh, it excites me a lot. And that's it. I think that's about 10 minutes. Have I gone over time? I have less than a minute remaining. So that's my talk. I hope, I hope it was okay. That was it. <laughs>